Hello, and welcome to the March 2024 edition of the U.S. Energy Insights. I am your host, Pamela Munger, and I'll be taking a look at the latest trends and market conditions within U.S. and global energy and sharing actionable insights powered by Vortex's tracking analytics. Last month, we were excited to welcome the Global Vortexa Analyst Team to London for a Market Analyst Insights event, which took place during IE Week. During the event, our Senior Oil Risk Analyst, Armin Azizian, delivered a presentation on sanction flows and the opaque fleet. This raised some interesting discussion points, so this month I've invited Armin to join me in a discussion about the topic and what the data is really saying. But first, in this insight, we will focus on these changing dynamics. Non-OPEC plus seaborne crude exports, Atlantic Basin versus Pacific Basin total product import patterns, Jack Caro, bullish or bearish, and we'll also take a look at the voyage distance changes for crude and clean tankers. On March 3rd, OPEC countries announced their extension of additional voluntary cuts of 2.2 million barrels per day for the second quarter of 2024 and likely beyond. Now let's take a look at how non-OPEC plus countries are making up for the shortfall in crude exports. In February, non-OPEC plus seaborne crude exports jumped 9% month on month, as you can see here in the red line. This is an 8% increase compared to February 2023. Now, if we drill down into where these exports are coming from, we find that the US accounts for most of the increase with elevated volumes rising an impressive 20% year on year with various sources estimating that U.S. production expectations are between 500,000 barrels per day and upwards to 1 million barrels per day in 2024, there is nowhere to go but up despite the return of refineries from spring turnaround season. And despite high levels of crude coming on the market from non-OPEC+, plus, we still see global crude inventories fall below the eight-year seasonal average, only raised recently due to the crude tankers taking longer to move around the logistical constraints in the Red Sea combined with OPEC cuts. Tank utilization has fallen by six percentage points below the eight-year average, providing some possible upside to price. We have just released a global inventory report, which gives clients a quick grasp of global onshore and oil at sea inventory trends with one look. 48 seasonal charts, daily data, overview table, expert comments, chart of the week, and a very unique data set, which is delivered to clients via their inbox in an easy to read and digest PDF. Now let's turn our heads towards the product markets where we can see very diverging patterns happening in the Atlantic Basin versus the Pacific Basin. Now the Pacific Basin total product imports are underpinned by LPG, gasoline, diesel, naphtha, and fuel oil in that order. Part of the reason for the downturn in imports into this region, of course, are the lower fuel oil and naphtha inflows coming from Russia, moving to the east of Suez. Now, this is a function of the attacks on NAFTA ports, Usluga and Tuopsi, and also a downturn in demand for NAFTA as LPG becomes the choice feedstock for Asia pet chems. Now, going forward, despite the revival of Novatech and NAFTA cargoes, China looks to have increased NAFTA imports mainly from Skikta, and therefore this could cause a continuation of overall lower imports into the Pacific Basin. Now, overall diesel imports are up in Oceania, India East Coast, Southeast Asia, while East and South Africa are marginally down, but only from relatively high values. Now let's look at the Atlantic Basin, where total product imports are mainly driven by diesel into South America East Coast and gasoline into West Africa and the U.S. Atlantic Coast. This is also attributed to the lower fuel oil imports into the U.K. continent. 
Now we are in the middle of refinery turnaround season. Imports are relatively lower and margins have softened. Let's look at this regionally to see some reshuffling patterns continue for the South Atlantic region, defined as South America East Coast and West Africa. This has been and will continue to be a market of cutthroat competition. You can see in the dark blue color flows from wider Europe, which include Russian diesel flows into Brazil, have and continue to push out flows from the U.S. Gulf Coast in light blue, making the U.S. Gulf Coast lose out market share. This is happening all before the Dangote refinery ramps up at fuel capacity expected by Q4 this year. Now let's take a look at the expected star of the 2024 market, Jet Caro Flows. At the beginning of the year, we heard that the majority of people are expecting strong demand growth in this market for this year, even to the extent that one of the trading companies forecasted a 600,000 barrel per day growth only in Jet Caro for 2024. This theory is a bit in contrast to what we have observed in the last couple of months. Now, although things can change very quickly down the line, it's still a topic we feel is worth discussing. Here we have created a top 100 import port chart showing the biggest 100 jet import ports where 90% of the flows are imports and not exports. And here we show the arrows that highlight the yellow line relative to the blue line, which has been coming down gradually over the course of last year. The first two months of this year continued the trend and are now close to the seasonal norm. The right-hand chart shows something similar, global jet caro imports into many countries globally, emphasizing the change versus the 2019 average. As with a few trade flow charts we are showing, the market looks to have not returned to 2019 levels. Imports have basically reached a level of 100,000 barrels per day below the 2019 average in late 2022. And ever since then, there has been no additional growth over the last four months, actually looks to be a downward trend. Now, air travel has picked up, but all types of improvements have also happened. Airline efficiencies, especially related to fuel, to cope with underlying increase in passenger demand. And it is possible that we have seen the peak of airline travel last summer. And now with off season, business travel may be a more important factor where many, including ourselves, are doing a lot of client briefings online. It is also doubtful that refineries will choose to make jet over diesel as regrades or the refiner's incentive for production are suggesting that limited supply is not the problem. There is a strong hope that jet demand in China will increase. However, our China specialists do not believe there will be a strong increase in travel outside of China. We understand that people there prefer to travel domestically instead of international. Now let's look at diesel arrivals into core Europe for February, after the second half of the month witnessed a surge of cargoes from the Middle East that were forced to move the long way around the Cape of Good Hope due to the Red Sea attacks. We can see that diesel arrivals into core Europe rise past the eight year average with barrels from the Med on the rise, which is also highlighted by the red line on the chart on the right hand side. And with all the reshuffling patterns and logistical constraints, we can see repercussions on the freight markets, starting with crude and clean product tanker average monthly mileage moving above the seasonal range. A source of optimism likely for the shipping market as any increase in activity could push freight rates upward. Now, since it's an election year in the US, and sanctions will likely be a hot topic, let's turn our attention to Vortex's senior oil risk analyst, Armin Azizian, and check in on sanctioned flows, the opaque fleet, and what the data is really saying. Hi, Armin. Thanks for joining. Hi, Pam. Great to be here. 
So Armin, can you can you shed some light? What has been the impact of the US and the UK imposing further sanctions on companies and tankers associated with the Russian trade? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, in, in recent months, we've seen the US impose sanctions on 32 tankers that are operating within the Russian trade. Now, to understand the impact of this, if we look at what's happening since December, we've actually seen on average on a net basis, 3.5 tankers leaving the Urals trade per month. Now, to understand the wider context behind this as well, looking back towards July of 2023, the Urals price cap was firstly breached we actually started seeing Greek operators start to leave the trade. And that's also picked up since December. And part of that 3.5 tankers leaving per month on a net basis are also accounted for by Greek operators, partly due to fear of repercussions if sanctions enforcement was to pick up even further. So we have seen an impact with regards to these tankers leaving the trade um, due to these sanctions. We're also seeing the fact that if we look at the Russian Urals trade versus, for example, the Espo trade on the Asia Pacific side, they're two quite different fleets. Mm -hmm. And these tankers that have been sanctioned really sit on the Urals side. So those tankers loading from the Baltics. So if we want to look at the impact on the Urals side, we also turn our attention to other high risk tankers, be it tankers that have previously been involved in Iranian or Venezuelan trade. So something we've been monitoring very closely here at Vortexa, uh, since the conflict started in March of 2022, tankers that have been switching from Iran and Venezuelan trade into the Russian trade. And what's quite interesting is our most recent assessment suggests that over that period of time, up until current date, 170 tankers have actually made that switch. And what that suggests to us is that there is high risk tonnage currently on the water that's able to make that switch because they can't really find employment in the mainstream trade. And so that being the fact that also over 80% of those 170 tankers are Aframax and Suez Max classes, and really the record high number was in January of this year, where we saw 50 tankers make that switch. That suggests to us that actually, despite this U sanctions enforcement from the US on tankers operating in Russian trade, there's enough tankers to replace them. And that's what we've been seeing in the recent months, especially in the last couple of months where US sanctions have been really picking up. So to really answer your question, we see the sanctions having an impact, but we don't think it's having enough impact because there's enough tankers to replace them. That's really interesting. Thanks for that. And speaking of um, the Iranian trade and Iranian tankers, we've also seen the U.S. impose sanctions on tankers involved in the Iranian trade. Um, so do you think that this will have any material impact on Iranian flows? Yeah, it's, it's another great question. I mean, from the last week of February until current date, we've seen the U.S. impose sanctions on four specific tankers. These four unique tankers have been operating in Iranian trade, hence why they've been sanctioned by the U.S. under OFAC. Um, to understand the impact of what this could mean, we should look at the wider fleet that's actually operating in Iranian trade. So if we look at 2023 as a full year, where Iranian crude and quantity exports really increased to the highest levels they've been since being since under their current sanctions regime, part of how that was able to happen was because the fleet also increased. So that fleet size, we've based on our assessments, for the tankers that operated in Iranian trade in 2023, it was over 250 tankers. That was a 20% increase year on year. And so that four, those four tankers they've sanctioned really is a small proportion of the wider fleet. So we don't expect it to have any significant impact. Another point to add here is that those four tankers they've sanctioned in recent weeks are still actually active on the water operating within the Iranian trade. So they really haven't been shifted away from the Iranian trade. I think one key reason for that is, as my point earlier, they can't really find employment in the mainstream trade. So they continue operating in these trades they're used to and can still operate in due to their age and high risk profile. Another point to add here is if you want to understand the impact of this, let's look at another fleet that's been sanctioned, the NNTC fleet, so Iran's government fleet. That fleet was sanctioned uh, years, a few years ago um, um, while Iran was under sanctions. We've also seen that fleet still operate in the Iranian trade despite being under sanctions. And again, in some way, that's helped Iran increase their crude exports to the level they've increased them to. So these, these four tankers they've sanctioned, we don't expect to have any material impact on either flows or the wider fleet. The one specific impact that could occur and should be all aware of is with China. So will Chinese ports allow these tankers to enter their ports to discharge the crude? 
Now, if we look at where they're going in China, the Shandong province, where the independent refiners are located, we have seen in recent weeks sanctioned tankers carrying a Russian crude actually enter these ports, which suggests that they might also do the same with sanctioned tankers carrying Iranian crude as well. One thing to be aware of as well with China is that uh, with the fleet having grown to 250 tankers carrying Iranian crude, they have enough tonnage to conduct STS operations if they need to, be it from sanctioned tankers into non-sanctioned tankers, which could then quite easily enter Chinese ports as they have been doing for many years now. So really to, to, to look at the, the impact of these sanctions, we believe it to be quite muted, partly because it's such a small portion of the fleet they've sanctioned, and also partly because of the wider size of the fleet, they can really conduct STOs operation and get around the sanctions and get their crew to the end buyer, largely being China. Hope that answers your question. That's great. Um, thank you, Armin, so much for shedding uh, some light on the intricacies of opaque flows and relevant sanctions. Thanks again for joining. Thank you. Well, that is all for the March edition of the U.S. Energy Insights. Thank you for watching.